Just a small etiquette point for our collective edification. One time, Srila oh, Prabhupada was in New York seated on Vyasasan. It wasn't quite as high as that, but a nice Vyasasan. And right in the middle of Jai Radha Madhava, he stopped. And he didn't say anything, he just pointed. There was a devotee, who was our GBC member, who was sitting on a seat in one of these little mats. And then next to him was his Srimad Bhagavatam. And Prabhupada stopped the kirtan and pointed and then said, where you sit should not be in the same place, same level as the Bhagavatam. The Bhagavatam should be elevated. Then he, like everyone, got it and <laughs> resumed chanting. So sometimes devotees put the Bhagavatam on a piece of paper or something that's, or put it on your lap or one of those book holders or some place other than the same level where you're sitting. It's just to respect the Bhagavatam. And if there are guests that come and don't know that rule, don't jump on them. <laughs> just be, be gentle and de or don't even mention it and tell them later. Don't, don't embarrass them. But the practicing devotees should know that etiquette principle. Hare Krishna. So this morning we're going to read through text 21, which means text 22 is tomorrow. This is, this collection of verses have very short purports or no purports. And it's um, Lord Brahma has come before Ranyakashipu, a little astonished. The yesterday's verses, he couldn't even find him because he was in an anthill covered with grass and bamboo shoots. And, but he saw some effulgence and some heat coming from the anthill, so that, then he started speaking with him. So this is this morning's verse, text 17. Shri Brahmo Vacha Utishto Tishta Padram Te Tapak Siddho Sikashyapa Varadoham anupraptho Vriyatam ipsito varaha Shri Brahmo Vacha O Tishto Tishta Padram Te Tapak Siddho Sikashyapa Radadoham anuprapto Vriyatam ipsito varaha Shri Brahmo vacha O tishto tishta badram te Vriyatam ipsato varaha Varadoham anuprapto Vriyatam ipsato varaha Shri Brahmo vacha 
उठिष्ठोतिष्ठभद्रम थे तपक्षिधो सी कश्यप भ्रमवाच उठिष्ठोतिष्ठभद्रम थे तपक सिद्धो च कश्यप वरदोहम अनुप्राप्त व्रीयतापो वर श्रीभ्रमवाच उठिष्ठोतिष्ठभद्रम थे तपक सिद्ध कश्यप वरदोहम अनुप्राप्त श्री ब्रह्मवाच उठिष्ठोतिष्ठभद्रम थे तपक सिद्धो सी कश्यप श्री ब्रह्म उवाच Lord Brahma said, "Utishta, please get up. Utishta, get up." That'd be a nice way to wake up the devotees in the Brahmachari ashram in the morning. Utishta, Utishta. Anyway, Bhadram. Good fortune, te, unto you. That would be nice. Utishta Bhadram te. Time for Magalarti. Tapa Siddha. Perfect in executing austerities. Asi, you are. <laughs> Kashyapa, O oh, son of Kashyapa, Varadha, the giver of benediction. Aham, I, Anupraptha, arrived. Vriyatam, let it be submitted. Ipsitaha. Desired, varaha, benediction. Translation: Lord Brahma said, "Oh, son of Kashyapa Muni, please get up. Please get up. All good fortune unto you. You are now perfect in the performance of your austerities, and therefore I may give you a benediction." You may now ask for me whatever you desire, and I shall try to fulfill your wish. Purport by Shila Prabhupada. Shila Madhvacharya quotes from the Skanda Purana, which says that Hiranyakashipu, having become a devotee of Lord Brahma, who is known as Ranyagarbha, and having undergone Severe austerities to please him is also known as Hiran Yaka. And I looked up the word Yaka, and I couldn't find it. There's references. There's Yaka Upanishad and Yaka this and that. But does anybody know the word Yaka means? Y A K A. No Sanskrit scholars. Hiran Yaka. 
rakshasas and demons worship various demigods such as Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva just to take the post of these demigods. This we have already explained in previous verses. So we'll go on. Translation for text 18. Brahma's continuing. I have been very much astonished to see you, to see your endurance, in spite of being eaten and bitten by all kinds of worms and ants. You are keeping your life air circulating within your bones. Certainly this is wonderful. And Prabhupada's astonishing purport. It appears that the soul can exist even through the bones as shown by the personal example of Ranyakashipu. When great yogis are in samadhi, even when their bodies are buried and their skin, marrow, blood, and so on have all been eaten, if only their bones remain, they can exist in a transcendental position. Prabhupada really goes on on the limb here. Very recently, an archaeologist published findings indicating that Lord Christ, after being buried, was exhumed and he then went to Kashmir. There have been many examples of yogis being buried in trance and exhumed alive and in good condition several hours later. A yogi can keep himself alive in a transcendental state, even if buried, not only for many days, but for many years. Hmm. Then you would say, prove me wrong. Text 19, Rama continues, even saintly persons like Bhrigu, born previously, could not perform such severe austerities, nor will anyone in the future be able to do so who within these three worlds can sustain his life without even drinking water for 100 celestial years, question mark. Report, it appears that even if a yogi does not drink a drop of water, he can live for many, many years by the yogic process, though his outer body be eaten by ants and moths. Text 20, translation. My dear son of Diti, with your great determination and austerity, you have done what was impossible even for great saintly persons, and thus I have certainly been conquered by you. Jitta means conquered. Krishna is ajitta, and one who is conquered is jitta. Prabhupada's purport. <coughs> In this in regard to the word jitta, Srila Madhva Muni gives the following quotation from the Shabda Nirnaya as follows. Parabhutam vashastam cha jitta bhid uchate budhai. Translation, if one comes under someone else's control, or is defeated by another, he is called Jitta. Hiranyakashipu's austerity was so great and wonderful that even Lord Brahma agreed to be conquered by him. And then the last of Lord Brahma's statements here. Text 21. Oh, best of the Asuras, Best of the Asuras. Asura Dwaj is usually, oh, here it is. Asura Pungava. Asura Pungava. 
O best of the Asuras, for this reason I am now prepared to give you all benedictions according to your desire. I belong to the celestial world of demigods who do not die like human beings. Therefore, although you are subject to death, Your audience with me will not go in vain. And Prabhupada's purport. It appears that human beings and asuras are subject to death, whereas demigods are not. The demigods who reside with Lord Brahma in Satyaloka go to Vaikuntaloka in their present bodily constructions at the time of dissolution. Therefore, although Haranyakashipu had undergone severe austerities, Lord Brahma predicted that he had to die. He could not become immortal or even gain equal status with the demigods. The great austerities and penances he had performed for so many years could not give him protection from death. This was foretold by Lord Brahma. So if you recall, before Lord Brahma comes, before Hiranyakashipu, he's already been informed by the demigods his intention, his determination, his motivation, his sankalpa. They already knew. He and um, the previous verse indicates, um, yeah, when he came, there were others with him. Brigu, whose reference is made in this series of verses, Daksha, and you know, we know how powerful and influential and so forth was Daksha. <laughs> and other great sages. So it wasn't just a solo one-on-one. -on -one. There was it's like a little collection of superlative sages and the Lord Brahma. So Hranikashipu, although he's an asura, he had uh, captured the attention and more than captured the attention, he had conquered, which was his intention. He had conquered Lord Brahma and all these great sages. That's a powerful asura. And his, you know, what we heard previously of the, the extent of his austerities, just never before, it's exactly as Brahma said, never before has something like this been done. And never in the future will something like this be done. It's just one of a kind. You're, you're the best. You're the greatest. I am the greatest. <laughs> yes, you're the greatest. So he's um, using some diplomacy, Lord Brahma. He's referring to him as the son of Kashyapa. So one of the things that in Vedic culture, at least, referring to someone by their uh, ancestry, it invokes respect for the person coming with great ancestry. In this case, it's just his father. Kashyapa Muni was one of the direct sons of Lord Brahma, and it's Lord Brahma speaking. So, on the one hand, he's, uh, he's reaffirming his superior position as as Kasyapa is very, very exalted, and you're his son, so you're exalted, I'm the father of Kasyapa, so Grandpa Lord Brahma. But his, he's, he's puffing him up, or not, he, he's invoking his higher nature, higher quality, by addressing him as the son of Kasyapa, and he's at the same time establishing very politely and very gently but clearly his his position superior position 
And in Vedic culture, when someone is in a superior position, even um, demons who are prone to follow Vedic culture, you know, modern people just don't follow anything, but those that are within the system of Vedic culture, as is Hiranyakashipu, then due respect goes to that superior person. That's, that's how he begins. Uh, and then Utishta, Utishta, his part, it's this repetition is literary wise, it's an ornament. And um, it's, it's another kind of respect, you know, You know, I'm, I'm standing, please stand, please, you know, let, let us, um, I don't know how to say it properly. Um, it's an expression of respect. Please rise. And um, Badram Te, we heard this already, where uh, the demigods are speaking like that to Lord Brahma, all auspiciousness, all good fortune to you, Badram Te. So he, now he's extending that. So it's, it's, the greeting is warm, respectful, and um, encouraging. Although he knows his disposition. <laughs> he wants to bump off Lord Brahma. Or if he can't bump off Lord Brahma, become the next Lord Brahma. And he, you know, so he knows his ambition, but speaking very, very pleasingly. Utishta, Utishta, Badram Te, son of Kashyapa. It's, it's, it's um, the, what I'm sharing here is um, culture. Lord Brahma is, is our original preceptor in our sampradaya. So we, we can learn from him about culture when, you know, we're from the, the nation of no culture. The culture of no culture can learn how to be cultured. So it's nice, nice instruction. Um, this word vara, in this verse appears a couple of times. Vara is that which he wishes to give. Vara is a benediction. I wish to give benediction. He's come to give, he's not come to take. He's to respect and I've come to give. Um, then he, uh, that, that's like announcing his mission or his, his reason for coming before him. He doesn't have to guess, you know, what, what's up here. I, I've, I've not come to harm you. I've not come to anything. I've come to give you benediction. And <clears throat> the, the reason for that is succinctly stated. <clears throat> You're perfect in your austerities. And commonly those that do some austerity, they have a purpose behind the austerity. And uh, his is a passion, ignorance, intention behind his austerity. But, you know, he doesn't question his intention. He knows what his intention is. And, you know, continuing further, he is giving a little hint that you want immortality? Uh-uh. Um, your Lord Brahma and the demigods are uh, don't die like humans die. Demigods also die. Lord Brahma also dies. In Brihat Bhagavatamrita, when Gopu Kumar goes to li visit Lord Brahma, he's he's so appreciative of his position. Excuse me, this is Narada. Narada goes to Lord Brahma. 
He goes, no, 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 no. You know, I, he, I, I, I'm in anxiety. If, if not tomorrow, the next day, I'm going to die. And then what? Of course, he's expressing like that, and Lord Brahma isn't so um, weakened by bodily attachment. But just making the, the expression, they're quite knowledgeable. They will also die. But their position, we're hearing in Prabhupada's purport, their position is different in that, uh, in some cases, uh, they may, they may not also, they may go to the spiritual world. In Brahma Samhita, the, the, the verse where Brahma is speaking about the post of Lord Brahma, um, there's a, a detailed explanation of the destination of Lord Brahma, in case you ever wondered, is not fixed. It's not every Lord Brahma goes to Vaikuntha. There's like six different po options that different Brahmas may do this and that and the other. Here Prabhupada is making reference to one and you know, for well-read devotees, when you read something in one place, it doesn't exclude other options that may be also elucidated in other places. It's important that just how readers should read, one reference is insufficient, multiple references, and taking the big picture of those multiple references is advisable. So at least in this case, Prabhupada is explaining one of the meanings, how the demigods and Lord Brahma do not die like mortals, mortal humans. They, you know, one is that they live long, long time, long, long time wonderful longevity, but although they must also die. So they don't die like mortals, that's one way. They live a long, long time. And this other is, they may, just like uh, we understand from Srimad Bhagavatam that the Pandavas did the same. They ascended in their self-same bodies. Their bodies became so spiritualized. They, in their self-same bodies, they, they attained, um, they went to Krishna. That's not ordinary. There's other not-so-ordinary things mentioned in this little section. But demigods may do like that. And then he goes on, Lord Brahma speaking about, he's already stated you have um, perfection of austerities, tapa siddha, perfect austerities. Now he describes some details about those perfect austerities. Um, endurance is mentioned, that it's also mentioned that his body was completely eaten leaving only bones. You know, when you get like a, a, an insect bite, what happens to your tension? What, what to speak of, you know, some, some piece of your body is being yanked out by that insect. Ritadvija Swami, some of you know Ritadva Jaswami. He was describing to me um, at, at the Houston Temple, there's some, a certain type of ant, I forget what it's called, but you know, it eats flesh. There's a certain name for them. And they, they you know, so they had to take care of that on the, Houston Temple property because kids would go play in the grass and you know, the ants would start you know, eating at their bodies. So Ritadva Chaswami for years worked with a, a, a Gurukula project for boys in Alachua. And one of the boys said, 
um, out, out, he took a, a wage. They, 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 they bet him that he couldn't put his hand inside the anthill of these particular kinds of ants. He put his hand like into the ant hole and he had to be taken to the hospital. <laughs> His whole hand was, you know, double the size and all red and, you know, pieces of flesh taken out and off to the hospital. Because it's like not just they eat, they just inject some kind of something, poisonous something. I don't know the science of it. So that's the kind of ant, these, this, the ant hill that had eaten away his body. I mean, how much tolerance and how much determination. And not only that. He was a mystic. He knew how to take his life airs. Prabhupada describes this in lectures. He could circulate his life airs through the marrow or the hollow of the bones. And that way the soul didn't leave because when the body is kaput, the, the soul leaves. That's what death is. The body is no longer fit for habitation. The soul leaves. See you later. That's death. He didn't die. So enduring the pain and maintaining his determination, mystic yogi circulating life airs within the marrow of his bones. And then Prabhupada elaborates. There's other yogis that have done such things. In, in samadhi, okay, now you can bury me and bury him under the earth and cover the earth up and you know, like you do when somebody's dead, but he's not dead, he's just in samadhi, and then uncover, the, you know, and there he is, in samadhi, and then voila, and go, oh, he must be God. And then Prabhupada goes on, not only for hours, for days, and for years, that these aren't ordinary people, but Hiranyakashipu was more than that, 100 celestial years. 100 celestial years. Of course, no water. You know, what do you need water for if you don't have a body? <laughs> but no, you know, not only fasting, like what the austerities that Dhruva did, you know, just before, you know, just air, just breathing, before that was water every, whatever it was, once a month. These are very severe. It's not meant for Kali Yuga. We have another kind of sacrifice to perform, sacrifice of the chanting of the holy name, but extreme. And now, just a little comment. Prabhupada was, there have been, I've been part of discussions um, of how Prabhupada would say extreme things. He wouldn't say that it was a fact, necessarily. He would say that some people say. So that's what he does here with Christ. Some people say. That he was exhumed and then he went to Kashmir, some people say. Now, for Prabhupada to say, some people say, um, it's pretty strong. Some people say, well, even, you know, some people say all kinds of crazy things. But if some other person said, well, no, it's not so because he's not exposed to, to that. It's just all I said was some people say. But in any case, something that Prabhupada said was Christ didn't die. Maybe you've heard that. He said, it's not, it's a misunderstanding. The, 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 the religion, one, one of the major takes in, within Christianity is that Christ died for our sins. It's major. So he accepted all the sins of all the people of the world. He gave his life accepting the sins of the whole world. So if you just accept him, all your sins are gone. That's, I mean, that's the, the theology of what do you do? We have our Bhagwat six canto theology of what do you, what is the antidote? What, what is the 
prevention for people who have to suffer sin. And at least one version of Christianity says, you accept Christ who died for our sins, that's his compassion, he died for our sins, you accept him and your sins are also gone. Just accept him and presto. Now Prabhupada, just say it again, Prabhupada's saying it's a misunderstanding, he didn't die. And you know, it's something like, something like um, Haridas Thakur being beaten in so many marketplaces. He didn't die. Although one could, an ordinary person would never, what the guards said, the people that were beating him, no one has ever lived past, you know, three or four marketplaces. They've never lived. And not only you lived, but there's no sign of fatigue. So surely we can understand you're a saintly person and we're here, here we've just been beating you. But not only we're going to get reaction for beating you, but the Kazi, when he finds that we didn't do it, we, didn't, we weren't successful in killing you, he'll kill us. Anyway, back to the statements of this purport. The statement is not that a, a, a highly elevated saintly person doesn't die. It's specific. It's specific to say yogis that know how to enter into a state of trance, a samadhi. They're still within the, the body, although the body is apparently not functioning. No, not there's, the breath is suspended. Who can live without breathing? But yogis may know how to do that. At least in Hiranyakashipu's case, you know, suspending the life airs because the soul is, the science is, the soul is situated on the life airs. There's resting on the life airs and carried by the life airs. So if you move the life airs, you can move the soul and go places and, you know, or stay or, you know, at will. It's subtle science. But when the life airs leave and when the soul leaves it, that's, that's death. So this isn't speaking about burying somebody when they're dead, it's burying somebody when they're in the state of samadhi. In any case, um, Lord Brahma is appreciating, expressing awe at the, the, the capacity of Hiranyakashipu. And then saying, Jitta, you have conquered me. You have defeated me. I, I, I am before you as your obedient Shisha, please instruct me. What, what, what benedictions that you, would you like? And you know, note that what he said in the very beginning is, um, I will try to fulfill your desire. But the last part he's saying is, I, you, you want immortality. The, the, the demigod told me, you want immortality, but it's not gonna happen. because you've been born in the human society, you're gonna die. So, so you know, hint, don't ask for immortality because it's not gonna happen. Of course, he asked for immortality. And then he's told again, you won't get it. I can't give you immortality. And the, the mission, just as a reminder, the mission is to uh, satisfy or respond to the appeal of the demigods. You know, the universe is, is in great danger because of his austerities. Please check it. So he's, he's minimally 
stop the austerities. So he's doing the austerities because he wants something and Lord Brahma is saying, I'll, I'll give you that something. Please stop your austerities. Because the heat and the, the, you know, the disturbance in the whole universe is too much. You know, that was the message from the demigods and they're very afraid. So it's do something to reduce that something. It's kind of like you know, a government officer may do something to prevent somebody who's causing disturbance for other people within the society. But he's so powerful. It, it, essentially, the demigods were saying, Hirani Kashipu wants to do austerities because he understands that's what you did, Lord Brahma, in order to get the post of Lord Brahma. So he's going to do austerities to get the post of Lord Brahma. And Lord Brahma is saying, these austerities are greater than the austerities that I have the capacity to do or bring or anyone else. So you're, you're, you're superior. You've achieved it. You've demonstrated it, your superiority, austerity-wise. And then the last point I'd like to make is, <clears throat> specifically, he's an asura, which means <clears throat> austerities that are not for the satisfaction of the personality of Godhead. There's no satisfaction of the personality of Godhead in the picture at all. He doesn't acknowledge the personality of Godhead. He wants to be his own idea of what is God. Because he doesn't accept there's God, he just wants to be the most powerful person in the universe, that's Lord Brahma. So he wants to be Lord Brahma in his estimation, his calculation, that's becoming God. No, it's silly, fundamentally silly, become God. I mean, there are persons, he's one, that have such an aspiration, impersonalists are another, have the aspiration, and it's silly. You don't become God, God is God. But still, they want to become God. So it's, it's like it's a post and somebody's occupying it and I want to occupy it. It's illogical. But that's, so that's how determined. We can learn a lesson from these personalities. How determined, how determined, fundamentally determined. Jarasandha is another one. How determined. He was defeated again and again and again and again. And he just kept coming back for more. Determined, determined, determined. You know, his, his mission was diabolical or atheistic or you know, anti-Krishna. But so determined. So we can learn something from these personalities who are very determined. Now, our determination, sankalpa, is one where it's dependent, not independent, but dependent. On, so we, we can still, like Mother Jasoda is binding Krishna. How determined was Mother Jasoda to bind Krishna? She didn't give up. She was relentless. Out of her maternal affection, not out of, you know, I'm going to get him. It was her, her parental affection was, was, was greatly determined. And Krishna supplies that. He says in Bhagavad Gita that he gives the determination to those who want something. He's the source of that determination. So for devotees, even you know, to be determined to become Krishna conscious or you know, to overcome our frailties, just like yesterday evening, this um, anishtata bhakti stage where um, being unable to fulfill that which we know will be beneficial for us or um, to refrain from the, those things that we know are detrimental to us. There are, our, our determination may be weak. Our, our spiritual strength may be weak. So where does that spiritual strength come from if we're weak? 
not just by crying or throwing your hands up in the air and say, I quit. It's um, striving in a dependent and serious and intentional manner um, to please Krishna and to please Krishna, receiving his mercy to please Krishna. We have those opportunities at you know, smaller, smaller stages always. And then, then there's the next, and then there's the next. There's you know, the, the challenges that we that are placed before us are uh, it somehow works this way. They just keep slowly appearing and becoming greater. Anyone that's been practicing devotional service for some time will know what I'm talking about. It, it's just you know impetus for surrender and further dependence upon Krishna. And then some ability, some strength, some capacity, some something Krishna supplies. And then, you know, that crisis is over and then comes another one. And then comes another one and then comes another one. It's just, it's, it's Krishna's kindness in helping us come to pure devotional service, unmixed devotional service, where we, there's nothing. Just like, you know, this, the, the initial position of bhakti is where Krishna should be pleased. So it, it helps us to get to the position where there's nothing but Krishna is being pleased. And then in that condition, anything becomes possible. The impossible becomes possible. Nice. It's very nice. It's a life of devotion. Krishna does Kaviraj states the same thing this way. The one who has implicit faith in Lord Chaitanya you know, mission impossible becomes possible. A blind man can see the stars in the sky. A lame man can climb mountains. Anybody that's had, you know, something that's wrong with your legs, like me, just, there was a time when just walking up the stairs was, you know, Tamahara had his knee replacement thing. And it, we were, were visiting someplace together and he had to walk upstairs and he said, well, the physiotherapist said it's good. You know, just now is time. You've done your exercises now from time to time, not too much, but you walk upstairs, it's good for you. But, you know, then climb a mountain. A layman, climb a mountain. It's, that's like a contradiction. Can't. A layman can climb a mountain. A blind man can see the stars in the sky. And a complete fool can understand the conclusions of the absolute truth by mercy of Lord Chaitanya, just by having implicit faith in him. So implicit faith means you do something, like reading Bhagavad Gita, you know, a newer devotee may not understand Bhagavad Gita's message. What do I do? I, you know, something wrong with me, or I'm, I'm dull, or it's too something. Just with faith, because there's this, our life of devotion includes very, very wonderful descending mercy factor. So it's not just us. We're not alone. We can feel lonely and helpless and all those things. But in a life of devotion, it's, it's not only not necessary, it's un, the suffering of material existence is totally unnecessary. If we just accept the shelter of Krishna as we're striving with the right means and the right purpose. We're sure of success. We're sure of success. The process works. And we can see in the lives of those who strive in that way, it may take some time, sustained over time, Assured of success. Our effort and descending mercy, both are, are necessary. And we're assured of success. Follow carefully, very sincerely, very carefully, follow. And depend on Krishna for success. That's the formula. Now, Hiranyakashi, who didn't have the depend upon Krishna for success component, very powerful. And 
Demons can also be very powerful, but where are they driving their power from? From the same place the devotees are driving their power from. But Krishna's, or the Supreme Lord's feature, he's Bhaktivatsala. He shows special favor to his devotee. Why? Because the devotee is depending upon him, whereas the Ranikashipu-like persons aren't depending on him. So he's just reciprocating with their inclination towards him. Not partial, it's natural, completely understandable. So we have this fundamental choice to make in our life. You know, do we want to be with Krishna? That's bhakti. And to be with Krishna means we want to please him. We want to love him. We want his happiness. And that's our happiness. That's the Bhagavatam is teaching us how to get there. And you know, Hiranyakashipu is teaching us some lessons about what won't get us there. Be very powerful because of calculated you know, extreme efforts. Not going to get you there. Okay, so any discussion? Yes. What is the austerity of praying to the demigods? Why, why does somebody do that? No, why does, why, like what causes the demigods to be disturbed by his austerities? Like what, what is the disturbance that's like, does it literally Why create, were they disturbed is your question? Yeah, like why are they disturbed by someone doing austerities? Like what causes them to be disturbed? Well, the whole order of the universe, the, his, the, the, the intention was because when one does austerity, there's a power that goes to that person from the austerity. And his intention was to reverse the order of things in the universe. And they're the controllers on behalf of Lord Vishnu. They're the controllers of the universe. And here's this other person doing radically severe austerities that wishes to reverse the order of the universe. So they, they were unable to do their service. I mean, aside from, you know, in addition, they're attached to their position and they're attached to like being controllers. That's why they're controllers. They like being controllers. But, you know, there's the service part and everything's going to be upside down. And he's, he's unbelievably powerful. He's more powerful than us. We're afraid of him. And he wants to turn us upside down and the whole universe upside down. Um, and another quick question. So you're saying about samadhi. Um, does that mean when like, a, you, know, um, you know, eternally liberated souls, when they come to this material world to teach, when they... Um, of supposedly leave their body or die, are they actually within their body still, just in samadhi? Like I didn't get the question. Like our, uh, when, when a pure devotee goes through death... When a pure devotee still, leaves his body... But are they leaving their body or are they just in samadhi within when their a body? When pure, devo a pure, pure devotees also leave their bodies. Okay. They leave their body behind and they go to Krishna. The soul goes to Krishna, the body's left behind. Right. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Hey, Krishna Maharaj, please accept me in our businesses. Maharaj, um, here in one of the verses, uh, demigods refer... In regard to? Demigods refer to Brahma, that uh, the three worlds are suffering or under trouble because of the uh, heat generated from the uh, austerities of the Hiranyakashipu. And, uh, actually, Most of us can't understand. Yeah. You got it. Yeah, yeah the, the demigods, they're saying to Lord Brahma, we're suffering because of the heat from the austerities of Hiranyakashipu. Suffering three worlds. They say three worlds there. But in the universe, there are 14 planets, no? Out in the universe, there's what? 14. There are 14 planets. They, they say 14 planetary systems? 
How do we relate them? The numbers of three and fourteen, how does it work? Yeah. That's your question? Yes. Okay. Take the microphone away from him. <laughs> how, it's, just, it's just a different perspective. So, the three are the upper, middle, and lower. That makes three. There's another way of looking at the upper, middle, lower. Instead, looking at it as 14. What's that? 14 upper, 14, excuse me, 7 upper, 7 lower. Makes 14. You know, Bhur Loka, Bhuvar Loka, Swarga Loka, that's 3. Mahar Loka, Jana Loka, Tapa Loka, Satya Loka, that's 7. That's the upper. And then there's seven lower. Makes 14. So it's another way of looking at the same thing. It's 14 instead of three. Is that what answer your question? Not exactly. You're smiling. You're laughing. So let's do it this way. Um, another example of the same thing is in the seventh chapter of Bhagavad Gita, it describes the material elements as being eight in number. Right? Bina Prakritir Ashtada, eight. Then there's another system that says there's 24. So which is it, eight or is it 24? It's just another way of analyzing the material elements. It's another system. Eight and 24 are both right. Not one is more right and the other is less right. They're both right. Just different systems. And you know, it can be detailed to say, how do you get 24 out of eight? But you know, it's... Similarly, three or 14. Just different systems. We do it all the time in, in our everyday life. Let's say, here's another example. You know, to get from point A to point B. One way, you get a road map. That's one way to get to, from point A to point B. Another is you go on, you know, the places that tell you to turn left after so many feet and so many miles, and that's another way to get there. Another way is a GPS. Another way is you get a globe out. And, you know, you, you know, there, there, and then there's, there's multiple other ways. But it's just how to get from point A to point B. There are different systems for doing the same thing. And there's another one. I can give some more. You know, geocentric and heliocentric models of the universe. It's just different models. It's just a different way of looking at the same thing. And it's allowed. Three and 14. Vedic. It's allowed. That's how you get it. You okay? No, he, the smile went away. Okay, okay. Anyone else? Yes, up front. Thank you, Maharaj. My question was, um, it said that these residents on Brahmaloka go back to Godhead in their same body. Some do, sometimes. Uh, but I understood that that's a heavenly planet, Brahma's body made of intelligence, so it seems like a contradiction. So yeah, something can become there. spiritualized, something that's because everything comes from spirit, including the material elements. It's a, it's, a, it's a separated material energy, but it can become fully spiritualized. That's how it's possible. Yes. Hey Krishna. Um, at the last section of your lecture, you were talking about having implicit faith in Krishna and striving uh, to please him in mm. what we're doing, uh, despite the adversities, just having that faith in Krishna. So my question is, um, Mm. 
one may have faith, but um, and uh, based on that faith, one keeps applying um, and uh, trying to please Krishna. But maybe a circumstance uh, or due to your whatever the service is, the situation not be changing in spite of um, trying to address the situation in different ways. Um, how to understand what is Krishna indicating? How to understand? What is Krishna indicating because you do what have is, faith. What is, how to understand? What's the phrase? Krishna, what is he indicating to you? What is he indicating to you? Well, that's the $64,000 question, isn't it? <laughs> yes. And, you know, it's, and, and circumstances of life continue to change. And they continue to change and they continue to change. So, there's a lot of different ways to respond to the question you're asking. Um, you know, a real short answer is we will not know until we become Krishna conscious. Or the reverse is one who is Krishna conscious, that person will know. And until then, we're, it's less than clear. But still we have to act, we have to live our lives. So how do we, that's another question, how do we move forward when you're not really clear what's Krishna's indication? That wasn't your question. Your question was, how do we know? That's really the question. Okay. Uh, I wrote a little essay, maybe 20 years ago, on this. And I probably would want to go back and look at it again, because 20 years ago I made it, may not have gotten it exactly right. But... Um, in, in some cases, just pause and wait till something that's not clear becomes clear or wait for some indication or sign that tells you turn left or turn right or whatever, go backwards or something. But sometimes, so that, that's, that's one option. Just pause and wait for some indication. But some things, ha you, ha you have to do something. You have to turn left or right. You, you know, that indecision is another decision. So you turn left or turn right. You have to, of, of options. There may be even like, you know, in that pause space, if one is practiced at the, the reflection, mode of goodness kind of reflection, not like, you know, what's my desire and, you know, you just leave those things to the side. What's Krishna's desire? Uh, it may be yet, a, you know, another thing of what Krishna wants besides left or right. So, but if, that's, if it's not clear and that action is required, then you begin, you take a, a cautious step, one or the other, which seems to be most appropriate, you know, for serving Krishna. Being, you know, antennas up, really looking to see, does Krishna want this? And if it, there's some indication from, from Krishna that Krishna doesn't want this, be very, you know, gently detached and retrace your steps and go the other direction. See, and, and same, wait to see the indication from Krishna. Is this, and there, and as we heard um, uh, Radhanath Maharaj describing, expect that there'll be mistakes, and we we wish to learn from the mistakes. And the mistakes aren't always. It's not necessarily that Krishna didn't want that. It's maybe the spirit that we were carrying when doing what Krishna wanted. You know, the the consciousness behind the action. So there's all kinds of, you know, to become a, a pure devotee is a lot of sacrifice. 
and a lot of very strong desire to be in tune with what Krishna wants. So just asking the question, you know, you're a good distance, maybe say generously, 50% there, just by asking that question. Because then there's a receptivity for Krishna to give some indication, but he may not give the 100% indication, just some, some indication of something. So we try to connect with Krishna. Now, I, I'll just add another thing. It's kind of like an embellishment to you know the, the second question, which was your question. One of the um, biggest problems in doing what Krishna wants is the stain or contamination of doership. But what I mean by that is, supposing one uh, asks, this happens in life, supposing there's a situation where we ask for some clear indication on something. You know, how to improve my chanting or, or um, just like, you know, you missed at the beginning, but there's a, a little presentation I gave on, on etiquette of Prabhupada uh, instructed right in the middle of Jai Radha Madhava, he stopped and had a devotee who would our DBC member who had his Bhagavatam on the floor on top of a little mat next to him and said, you can't have the Bhagavatam in the same position as where you're sitting. Okay, so then there's an instruction, whatever it is, whatever it is. And then, okay, now doership, I'm going to go do it. I got this nice instruction, I'm going to go do it. Instead of staying in the position of I'm executing an instruction. I'm, in, I'm acting in my relationship with, with Krishna. The doership mentality spoils everything, even when you do the right thing. It may not, you know, that's not the right consciousness to be in when you're doing the right thing. And that's what, that's what Krishna consciousness requires, ultimately, is that bhakti, as, as we were hearing yesterday evening, for the satisfaction of Krishna consciousness. That's the consciousness, even when doing the right thing. Because the, the, the bad, the, the wrong consciousness can spoil the outcome. Krishna is not pleased. That's the spoiling of the outcome. So really, the, the, the essence of to do what Krishna wants is to be in the consciousness of doing what Krishna wants. That's really what we. That's really the conscious. That's really the the, the cultivation requirement. It's, you take the other thing. Even if you do something. That's not what Krishna wants. If you're in the consciousness of sincerely trying to do, trying to please Krishna, like a, a, a classic example that comes to mind is when Krishna had gone to uh, Hastinapur to arrange for peace settlement, he was invited to take a royal situation. He declined. Instead, he wanted to stay at the house of Vidura. And Vidura's wife was in such ecstasy. There are different versions in Mahabharat. One was she fed Krishna the banana peels instead of the banana. And Krishna ate them because of the devotion with which she offered. She just was so excited to having the opportunity to serve Krishna. Another version said she fed him porridge. This is Bhakti Chaitanya Maharaj's, you know, it's a British term, porridge like, you know, an inferior quality food. But she was very pleased. Or, you know, Krishna and Sudama with the, the, the broken rice. That's not what you go to offer Krishna, broken rice. So it's the consciousness that's the essence of doing that which Krishna wants. That's the essence. And it's very easy to get, I mean, we're, we're very habituated to false ego to doing that which we understand to be right and just, you know, doing it is right. And, you know, the consciousness isn't right and therefore it makes disturbance to ourselves and others. It's, it's, it's subtle, but it's the essence of our Krishna consciousness. It's a small point, 
but it's one of the most important points of all and in doing what Krishna wants is the spirit of wanting to do what Krishna wants for his pleasure that's bhakti and bhakti then it, it, everything gets adjusted by Krishna Jitendriya uh, she has one more a follow up Hang on, hang on. She's going to do the follow-up, and then you get the microphone. Go ahead. Uh, can I have a one-on-one -on -one follow-up? Because there are quite a few questions with you later. Sure. Thank you. Sure. We have some scheduled time, don't we? Could you explain the expression that I've heard you use Sometimes your best isn't good enough. Do you ever you remember saying that? Sometimes your I best said good intention isn't good enough. Oh, I good intention. I, I thought on one occasion I heard you say, maybe your best isn't good enough. No, good intention isn't good enough. That's what that's oh, the okay. phrase. Okay. Thank good you. intention isn't good enough. You know, as far as best, it's you know, it's your. You know, that's it. Well, what's, what, what do you mean by best? If, if the sincerity is behind whatever it is, that's good enough. But, you know, then on the other hand, the devotee is thinking, well, that's not good enough. I have to actually deliver the best. Yeah. I heard another expression, uh, the road to hell is paved with good, good intentions. Good intentions. Yeah, I've heard that one before. I've been down that road before. Something else? Okay. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Jai.